Hang on, you, you got a half an hour and you get a beer. Um, <laughs> so we just observed a dramatic monetary experiment. Uh, in the US, the short-term interest rate was stuck at zero for eight years, and reserve rose from 10 billion to 3,000 billion. Uh, yet, as you can see, inflation behaved in this recession and expansion almost as exactly as it did in the previous one. And long-term bonds, 10-year government bonds, just continued their gentle downward trend. Uh, Europeans, uh, Europe's bound is ongoing with the same result. Uh, Japan, thanks Stephanie, had essentially zero interest rates for 23 years. And what happened? Inflation stayed uh, quiet and slightly negative the whole time. Our government set off what should have been uh, two monetary atom bombs, and almost nothing happened. This experiment has, has deep lessons for monetary economics. We learned that inflation can be stable and quiet. I use quiet to mean the opposite of volatile. In a long-lasting period of immobile interest rates and despite immense uh, reserves. The simplest theoretical interpretation of that is that inflation is stable under passive policy or even under an interest rate peg. Alternative stories, uh, Stephanie mentioned that we had 23 years of bad luck, are really strained. Now, stability is the central concept in my remarks today, and I emphasize it with, with the cute picture here. Uh, if inflation's unstable, then a central bank is like a seal balancing a ball on its nose. If inflation's stable, the bank is like Professor Calculus there swinging his pendulum. Um, watching data on inflation and interest rates in normal times, you can't tell if it's the seal or if it's the professor. And asking the professor won't help. I, it, those of you who are Tentan fans will know the professor thought he was following the pendulum, not the other way around. But, but if you hold still the seal's nose, or if you hold still the professor's hand, you can find out is it stable or unstable. We just ran that experiment. The result, inflation is stable. And many, many hallowed doctrines of monetary policy fall by the wayside as a result. <clears throat> Quantities. The optimal quantity of money is illustrated by the McDuck family. We learn that arbitrary quantities of interest-paying reserves do not threaten inflation or deflation. We can live the Friedman optimal quantity of money. There's no need to control the quantity of reserves. There's no need for government debt to be artificially illiquid by maturity or determination. Governments could offer reserve-like debt to all of us. I think it's about four hallowed doctrines just, just hit the floor. The in lessons for interest rates are, are, are even uh, deeper. Now, there's a common structure uniting all the views that I'm going to discuss, uh, the standard three-equation model, an IS relation, a Phillips curve, uh, and, and a, a Taylor rule. I add here the, the government debt valuation equation, and that states that an unexpected inflation or deflation, which changes the value of government bonds, must correspond to a change in the present value of surpluses. Now, these equations are not an issue. All models contain these equations, including the last one. I think it's footnote four of chapter four in Woodford. Uh, the issue is, how do we solve these equations? How do we use them? How do we interpret them? For example, what's the nature of expectations? Adaptive, rational, or somewhere in between? How do we handle multiple equilibria? And what's the nature of monetary fiscal coordination? I'll give you a little preview. That last one is, I think, the key to solving all the puzzles. Now, the adaptive expectations view uh, from Friedman 1968 on to much of the policy world today makes a very clear prediction. Inflation is unstable, the seal with the ball, so a deflation spiral breaks out at the zero bound. Uh, I simulated a simple model like that in the graph just to make it visual. There's a nat negative natural rate shock, the interest rate hits the zero bound, and then deflation spirals away. The deflation spiral did not happen. This theory is wrong. I'm sorry, Friedman 1968, that started the government cannot peg a in nominal interest rate. They just did, and it's stable. The new Keynesian tradition uh, uses rational expectations. A and changing the time indices from minus one to plus one, now the model is stable all on its own. And that is a big feather in the new Keynesian cap. It just survived uh, th this experiment. But the new Keynesian model only ties down expected inflation. Unexpected inflation can be anything. There's multiple stable equilibria, as I indicated visually from this uh, beautiful graph from Stephanie's great JPE paper. 
The bound or any passive policy should then feature sunspot volatility among these uh, multiple equilibria. Um, for example, Clarida Galleon Gertler famously claimed that the passive policy in the 1970s led to inflation volatility, sunspots. Active policy in the 80s quieted down that inflation. A generation of researchers worried that Japan's zero bound and then our own would lead to the, the same kind of volatility. It did not happen. Inflation is quiet and thus apparently determinate at the bound too. This theory is wrong, or at least incomplete. Now another new branch of New Keynesian thinking uh, selects among the mu multiple equilibria during the bound by expectations of future active policy. So to illustrate, this graph presents inflation in a, a very simple New Keynesian model. There's a negative natural rate shock from time zero to five that, that sends us to the zero bound during time zero to five, and, and then we exit. And there's multiple, as you can see, stable inflation paths that, that are consistent. That's what stability means. Now, now we got multiple equilibrium. The lower red equilibrium is, is the common choice in this literature, and it features a deep deflation and a recession. To choose that equilibrium, authors assume that after the bound ends, the central bank returns to active policy, threatening to explode the economy for any but its desired target, which, which is zero here. And then working back, you would choose the lower red equilibrium during the period of the bound. Um, now, in this view, uh, small changes in expectations about future inflation, uh, I graphed it at the exit of the bound, work backwards to bigger changes at earlier times. So if the central bank could just promise a little bit extra inflation uh, above its target at the end of the bound, that promise would work backwards to a big stimulus at periods during the bound, uh, the magic of forward guidance. So one of Mike's main points today is, is that a price level target can help to enforce uh, such a commitment, which is hard to promise otherwise. Stephanie's policy of raising rates to raise inflation at the end of the bound can similarly work its way back and give you stimulus during the bound and maybe even keep you out of the bound altogether. Well, that's great, but, but this selection by future active policy has huge problems. First, it says that promises further in the future have bigger effects today. It explodes backwards. To test that, I tried it on my wife. I said, how about you cook dinner tonight and I'll clean up five years from now? It didn't work. Second problem, as we make prices less sticky, dynamics happen faster, so the backward explosions happen faster. So even though price stickiness is the only friction, if you make prices less sticky, the deflation and depression get worse, the, the green line. The frictionless limit there is negative infinity, but the frictionless limit point is just a small inflation and no recession at all. So there's a big discontinuity there. The New Keynesian literature is ripping itself to shreds to fix these paradoxes. Uh, Mike, in, in his last few slides, Xavier Gebex and others abandon rational expectations, but even that step doesn't fix the problem. So, so Mike offers a K-step inductive expectations. It's really complicated. I spent over a month trying to reproduce the basic example, and I failed. So you have to be a lot smarter uh, or more patient than me to use it. Maybe not as smart as Mike, but a lot more than me. Uh, moreover, as you can see by the green line, it only reduces the magnitude of the backward explosion, not its fundamental nature. So all the limiting puzzles are still there. Uh, um, Gebex's uh, uh, solution, if we go back to uh, adaptive expectation, that offers a similar, it takes a similar 100 pages of equations, but then, then you're back to stable backward, but explosive forward. Well, stable backward solves the forward guidance puzzle, but the lack of a spiral just told us that inflation is stable forward. It's also not small. You have to move eigenvalues from above one to less than one, so it's, it, you have to make a big change. So, drum roll, what's the answer? The answer uh, I like to call the fiscal theory of monetary policy, you might have guessed. The model is completely unchanged, but we just solve it uh, a little bit differently. We remove the assumption that surpluses passively accommodate the price level, and, and we pick now equilibria by the unexpected inflation at the left side of the graph, not by things at the right side of the graph. So, so an unexpected deflation can only happen in any model if governments will raise taxes or cut spending to pay a windfall to bondholders or via discount rates, which actually is more important, 
If there's no fiscal news, for example, then we pick the equilibrium with the big red square at zero, and you just get a little mild inflation. Now, now this isn't some wild new theory. You say fiscal theory and everyone goes nuts. It's just the wealth effect of government bonds. Uh, M Mike and I are replaying Keynes versus Pigou here, just with a whole lot better equations. The result I is a model that is, is very simple. Sorry, I lost where I was here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's simple, it's stable, and it solves all the puzzles. Uh, so instantly, you know, why did the big downward deflation jump not happen? Well, because the Great Recession wasn't accompanied by a deflationary fiscal tightening. If you tie down the left end of the graph, promises further in the future uh, can't have bigger effects today, and you have a smooth frictionless limit. Tying down the left end of the graph stops all the backwards explosions. You actually, you don't need to be precise or argue about which one. The limits are cured if you can just bound the size of fiscal surpluses and, and thus bound the movements on the left hand of the graph. We can keep rational expectations. Now, now that's not a religious point. Uh, I think irrational expectations are a fine ingredient for matching data and real world policy, like introducing some lags in the Phillips curve. Uh, but Mike and others' efforts to repair uh, this problem with irrational expectations are not a little epicycle. If you read uh, Garcia, Schmidt, and Woodford, the basic properties of monetary policy depend on people never catching on. In fact, all of economics and all of finance have to abandon rational expectations, even as rough explanations, just to solve some murky paradoxes of the zero bound. That, that's a lot to swallow. I mean, even Andre, who today was not a great fan of rational expectations, he's building on the, the rational expectations efficient markets and then add some irrationality and, and, and you add some stuff. That's fine, but that doesn't mean no one, that doesn't mean it's illogical to use rational expectations. I didn't think the day would come that, that we would fly to Sweden and I would stand up to defend the basic new Keynesian program and that Mike would be trying to tear it down. Yet, yet here we are, promote the fiscal equation out of the footnotes and you can save uh, all the rest. Neo-Fisherism, uh, what Stephanie was talking about, is an unavoidable con consequence of stability. If, I'll put, if inflation is stable at the peg and if I move interest rates up, inflation must eventually go up. It, it might go down in the short run, but it eventually has to go up uh, if it's stable. St stability delivers the long-run Fisherian result. Now, conventional wisdom goes strongly the other way. Uh, but there's still the question whether uh, a, a permanently higher interest rate could temporarily lower inflation, accounting for most of our belief, because we don't observe uh, many permanent interest rate increases. Now, even the temporary ones, how did Harold and, and, uh, and Marty get a temporary a decline in interest? The conventional Keynesian model pairs the rise in interest rate with a negative fiscal shock, achieved passively, but it's there. The government raises taxes, and that's what brings inflation down. I'd like to get a negative, can we get a negative short-run effect without this magic fiscal policy stepping in to, uh, to, stepping in to give a present to bondholders? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, if the, the fiscal theory of monetary policy can deliver a temporary negative effect, if you add long-term debt, and I, and I won't have any fiscal shocks either. So the graph here shows you the price level. Uh, the model is a completely frictionless economy. All I've got is a Fisher equation and, and the valuation equation. What happens is when, when nominal interest rates rise, the, watch the left-hand side of that equation. Nominal interest rates rise, that means the market value of long-term debt declines. I'm not gonna do any fiscal stuff, so the present value of surpluses doesn't change. So if the numerator on the left goes, it goes uh, down, the price level on the, on the left also has to go down. So what you get with long-term debt, uh, you, you get, a, uh, you get a, a, first a deflation and then the inflation. If we add sticky prices to that, uh, that's what you get. Uh, then, then the rise in interest rates gives you a smoothed out disinflation and then the, the long run Fisherian effect. So I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable, even though long run Fisherian response function. Um, in some then, uh, the, the Fisherism, the long run Fisherian result, which I don't think is as uncontroversial as Stephanie said, because Milton Friedman didn't believe it, uh, it is an inescapable consequence of stability. The fiscal theory can give you that temporary negative sign, 
but only if the interest rate rise is unexpected and only in the presence of long-term debt. And I think those considerations together all amplify Stephanie's call that if you want to raise interest rates, raise inflation with raising interest rates, then do it announced ahead of time and, and do it slowly so you don't get the negative thing. And I think the contrast between the U.S. that seems to have followed Stephanie's advice uh, in rising inflation with Japan and Europe, which didn't and still has low inflation, is suggestive here. But, but we have to beware. These arguments don't mean that high inflation countries like Turkey and Brazil and Venezuela can just lower rates and lower inflation. Uh, everything here flows from fiscal foundations, and absent the fiscal foundations, there's nothing central banks uh, can do. So to conclude, I, I promised you that the uh, lower bound was an experiment that would deliver deep implications for monetary theories. And think of the hallowed doctrines that have been overturned in the last 15 minutes. We're down to how does this darn thing work anyway uh, of inflation and interest rates. Uh, what I've said, uh, I'm only discussing, so I only get to advertise a couple papers, but what, I, what I've said today is here. Uh, they go on to show uh, that this fiscal theory of monetary policy can give you a simple, unified framework for interest rate policy, quantitative easing, forward guidance, and it works even in completely frictionless models, and then you add price stickiness to get realistic uh, uh, dynamics. If I talk too fast, but I sparked your interest, both the slides and what I just said is, is on my webpage. <laughs>